is the boundary, truly, between noise and music? Is it disingenuous for us to describe a record like, say, Lou Reed's metal machine music, or some of John Lennon's very early works, or a performance piece by John Cage as noise, and true to describe them as music? Or is there intent not to be music, but in fact noise masquerading as music? I suppose a highly subjective set of demarcation points between the two is necessary, and I would love to hear from you if you have any different from me. One might say that noise is sound to which few, if any, set disciplines have been applied, whereas music is sound to which a very great number of set disciplines have been applied. Note values, scales, keys, rules of dynamics and harmonic relationships, etc. At that point, composers can diverge from the rules applied either by mixing or matching them, or by withdrawing them to create different kinds of music. But at what point in the latter case do we withdraw so many rules that the music regresses back to that borderline between cosmos and chaos, between harmony and anarchy, between order and riot? Where I'm going with this, of course, is to perhaps the most significant event in jazz in that miraculous year of 1959, certainly the most divisive, as it is what is seen as the announcement of a new movement in the music, free jazz and the arrival of its sponsor, Ornette Coleman. Free jazz, under whatever guise, has been indicated at for about 15 years before Coleman first brought it to the prom. Chaps like Lenny Tristano and Jimmy Guffrey. Guffrey was a bit of an eccentric character if you ever want to hear some extremely challenging music, or noise depending on your point of view, check out his 1963 album Freefall. His band broke up one night shortly after Freefall was released when after playing a Pass the Basket gig in Greenwich Village, they collected the princely sum of 35 cents. But Coleman's Shape of Jazz to Come album really took strides towards becoming what we now know as free jazz, a journey he was to complete on his 1961 album, not unsurprisingly called Free Jazz. The shape of jazz to come isn't as terribly radical as later free jazz became, but it did contain some landmark stylistic, harmonic and compositional moment. It's less dramatic rhythmically, although Charlie Hayden playing slow, riffy pulses on the bass and Billy Higgins playing fast, driving drums wasn't something seen before in jazz, but it later had a big influence in rock music. Where it gets tricky is Coleman and cornetist Don Cherry. Cherry is one of the most polarizing figures in the classic canon, a much in demand player whose work has been described as lyrical, open and quiet. By the way, Nina Buffalo stands Cherry as his stepdaughter. Well, he might be a lyrical, open and quiet player, but I fail to hear those things in his work with Coleman. The problem is, and I'll be blunt, that he and Coleman are so wedded to the concept of absolutely free improvisation that their disregard to traditional harmony sounds almost accidental instead of being an integral part of the arrangement. On the shape of jazz to come, it becomes apparent at the end of the very first melodic phrase of the opening number, Lonely Woman, where the twin streams of Coleman's alto and Cherry's cornet diverge at the end into an ugly consonance. One of the rules of this new jazz is that it redefines the relationship between the orders of solos, with no corded instruments, piano or guitar, in the rhythm section, it means that soloists have only themselves to harmonize against. So the notion of discrete solos in a cycle, like on, say, Kind of Blue, goes by the by. Both Coleman and Cherry use harsh overblowing frequently, and Coleman persistently applies stop squeals to colour his tone. Coleman also dissolves the relationship between the bar, the beat, and the placement of the music within them. I find it difficult to follow the thematic development of ideas or the narrative arc of the music, so I find, and again your mileage may vary, that the only way to approach the music is to immerse yourself in it as an object and try not to think about what makes the music, just what the music has made. 
Some will say that Coleman merely extended and complexified the melodic ideas of the modalists, creating new and challenging concepts in harmony and chromaticism. But without any frame of reference as to what we're trying to achieve here, it's very hard to tell what is theoretically one thing from the evidence of our ears, while the evidence of our ears suggests another entirely. In fact, what the evidence of our ears suggests may well be better encapsulated in any number of quotes from his peers, such as Dizzy Gillespie, who said, I don't know what he's playing, but it's not jazz, and who, when he first met Coleman, asks, are you cats serious? Roy Eldridge, who said, I've listened to him all kinds of ways. I've listened to him high. I've listened to him stone cold sober. I even played with him. I think he's jiving, baby. Thelonious Monk exclaimed, man, that cat is nuts. Maynard Ferguson was brutal. He's got bad intonation, bad technique. He's trying new things and he hasn't mastered his instrument yet. And Miles Davis was simply hell. I just listened to how he writes and what he plays. If you're talking psychologically, that man is all screwed up inside. On the other hand, Charlie Mingus, which figures, John Coltrane, Herbie Hancock, and Shelley Mann were all committed supporters. I'm not going to go through the album song by song for you for two reasons, possibly born of one another. But really, once you've heard the opening song, and that song could be really quite good if, and I'm going to say it, there were more discipline in the soloing, You've effectively heard what the album is about. Scattergun solos, wonderful accidents, and frankly, some jarring clams. I have to admit, I simply don't understand this music well enough to make a more informed commentary on it. And I don't want to say I don't like music if I don't really understand why I don't like it. So let's look at its historical significance and why it's considered to be a landmark in jazz. The shape of jazz to come did redefine the relationship between soloists and the rhythm section, freeing each of them up to solo independently and rely on their own instincts to find grooves or tonic relationships in their music. It made spontaneity in performance the highest virtue. Whereas James Brown, a musician of incalculable influence, came to the realization that every instrument in a band, including himself, could be used like a drum, Coleman saw that every instrument in his group was equivalent to a human voice, but not as a voice in a choir, as a voice in a marketplace of conversations. Crying, singing, preaching, calling out in pain, cooing in love, and with each instrument a free and equal partner in the collective improvisation, it meant all voices that it reflected were free and equal. And in 1959, to an African American, the word free must have been impossibly loaded, the dominant word in the emotional conversation of an entire peoples. Free voices, free ideas, free to pursue a vision. Coleman's influence, while most apparent in the chaotic and relentless final recordings of John Coltrane, were also adapted and disciplined by Miles Davis on albums such as On the Corner and the noisier parts of Feeder Kilimanjaro, and also tantalizingly in Tony Williams's composition Black Comedy on Miles in the Sky. Albert Isla, the tragic Eric Dolphy, and the frankly bonkers Pharaoh Saunders all followed prominently, as did Coltrane's wife Alice. But it's in rock music that Coleman's influence lasts longest and was applied most successfully. The Velvet Underground, Frank Zappa, the Uncle Meat album especially, Sonic Youth, Niels Klein and Wilco, The Grateful Dead, not so much musically but organisationally, Richard Wright of Pink Floyd, Robert Wyatt and most obviously and controversially Captain Beefheart's Trout Mask Replica album, all bear witness to Coleman's ideas and his fearless pursuit of individual voice. I would love anyone who knows more about this than I do and to step in and adjust my assessment of Coleman's music. The question is, until we have that expert reappraisal, do you, my devoted viewer, really need to hear this album in the way you've heard the previous five? For the person who's looking for a stepping off point into enjoying and appreciating jazz, the answer bluntly is no. 
All of our previous presentations have been included because they offer a new listener music that was still identifying as projecting and progressing all that is best and most relatable in jazz. The Shape of Jazz to Come is an important album made by an important musician that perhaps contributed to redefine some of those things best in jazz, but I cannot recommend it for the novice jazz fan. Ornette Coleman passed away in June 2015, one of the last men standing from the class of 59. Good morning, meine Freunde. So this brings us to the end of our 1959 deep dive. I sincerely hope that anyone with an interest in jazz either had it sparked, nurtured or indulged by the series. And I welcome comment and questions. The greatest state of being is when smart people disagree with you. I have no hesitation in saying that this was the most difficult of the six pieces to conceptualise and to write, largely because I came to a, a point where I realised I didn't fully understand the music I was talking about and I couldn't make an effective criticism on that basis. My biggest problem was the resistance of the traditional conservatism of jazz. Jazz is based on swing. If it doesn't swing, it's not jazz, it's the blues or something else. In this case, though, it was when I realised that you have to look at Coleman's output as a whole, or the album as a whole, and realise that it was its cultural, its social, and even its political ramifications that made this an important music, and one worth necessary of using to sum up what was a triumphant year for jazz, but a tumultuous year for the rest of the world in 1959 such as the price of ambition. All that remains now is to say, uh, please feel free to leave a like, leave a comment, subscribe if you wish, and normal, such as it is, transmission will be resumed on the Righteous Bo Jambo next week. So, until then, may your Bo Jambo forever be righteous.